there's like a few seconds.
Hello, everyone. Good evening. Right at 7 o'clock, so uh, we'd like to get started. I want to welcome everyone to our meeting tonight, and thank you all for coming. I would like to start off with introductions. Uh, my name is Seth Brackey. I'm the Assistant Water Division Manager with KPU. Uh, also, along with me from the Water Division, is our Water Division Manager, John Klaniker. Also with us tonight is our Acting City and KPU Manager, Lacey Simpson. Thank you, Lacey. Uh, we also have a City Council Member in attendance tonight, uh, Jay Matani. Thank you for being here, and thank you to everyone uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here for those attending on the uh, live stream. Also with us tonight is uh, Floyd Dameron. He's a VP and senior project manager with our consultant, Jacobs, and has worked on a lot of KPU water projects over the years. So thank you, Floyd, for being here. Uh, also, Observing via the live stream, uh, we have Cindy Christian, who's the program manager and our main point of contact with the State of Alaska Drinking Water Program. Again, welcome and thank you everyone for being here. Ketchikan Public Utilities would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional first people of this land in Ketchikan, the Tongass Tlingit people. For our safety moment tonight, please recognize the need for safety precautions in response to the COVID risk in our community. Proper distancing and prudent safety measures are encouraged. Thank you. Our agenda tonight includes a short presentation followed by an opportunity for everyone to ask questions and to comment. Uh, to start off, let's talk about why we're here. The water KPU is delivering to customers now meets all state and federal drinking water requirements. What we're here to discuss tonight is how KPU is requesting ADEC to approve a limited alternative to filtration. That's an approach that will allow us to avoid the great financial cost of building a filter plant and why is that so important? Well, a new filter treatment plant won't provide any safer finished drinking water for the community and come at a tremendous cost that our city really can't afford. The state of Alaska DEC supports this approach and they've established a compliance order by consent that outlines the tasks necessary to formalize this. So next, we'll play a short seven-minute video that we had produced to help explain our situation to the Environmental Protection Agency and other regulators that may not be familiar with Ketchikan. It offers a good summary of our proposed approach. So here we go. Ketchikan is a city of 8,200 people that sits on Revillagigedo Island in southeast Alaska. The first major port in the southernmost part of the state Ketchikan is a popular cruise stop along the Inside Passage. The economy is largely based on tourism and commercial fishing. The city's water is delivered by Ketchikan Public Utilities from Ketchikan Lakes and Granite Basin, two pristine, uninhabited water sources in the mountains above Ketchikan. Water combines at Fawn Lake and flows to town through a tunnel that is jointly used by KPU for water supply and power generation. 7,000 acres of the watershed is primarily owned by the U.S. Forest Service. Approximately 40 acres is owned by the Bureau of Land Management. The Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, ADEC, recently issued a requirement for KPU to build a water filtration plant at an estimated $70 million cost to construct and $2 million per year to operate and maintain. 
KPU hired Jacobs, the leader in water treatment design, to further study the feasibility of adding a water filtration plant to stay in compliance with state and federal regulations. Jacobs' study found that the new plant would not result in an improvement to public health protection. Rather, it would have a much greater environmental impact and much greater cost to the community. To better understand this unique scenario, let's first dive into the regulatory and water treatment timeline leading up to this requirement. Ketchikan began disinfecting its water with chlorine in 1956, which it continues to this day. In 1989, the Surface Water Treatment Rule, SWTR, required filtration of all surface water sources with the exception of those meeting stringent criteria to remain unfiltered. The EPA acknowledged that KPU met the criteria for this exemption. In response to the SWTR in 1995, the Bear Valley Reservoir was constructed to allow chlorine enough time to completely disinfect the water. In 1998, the EPA enhanced the SWTR by introducing a new minimum level of treatment for unfiltered systems, UV and chlorine. At this time, the EPA added Section 106 to the Safe Drinking Water Act amendments, which allows for the limited alternative to filtration. This acknowledges that a watershed may be appropriate to remain unfiltered with a higher level of treatment, even if it does not meet coliform and turbidity triggers in the source water. In 1999, KPU added soda ash to reduce corrosion in the distribution system and lower lead and copper at the tap. In 2010, KPU added UV disinfection to provide giardia and cryptosporidium disinfection. This additional treatment allowed KPU to decrease the amount of chlorine used for treatment. KPU's water now has a double barrier, UV and chlorine. In 2013 and 2016, chloramination was added to further reduce disinfection byproducts. In November of 2019, the state of Alaska issued a requirement to Ketchikan that a water filtration plant be installed. So, what triggered this requirement? Let's take a closer look at the filtration avoidance criteria to remain unfiltered. Of the 11 criteria, two relate to source water quality, coliform and turbidity. KPU's source water fecal coliform descended slightly into non-compliance for a brief time in 2019. The criteria allow source water to have more coliforms in the water than the trigger amount for up to 10% of the time in a six month period. KPU's water increased to 11% for one reporting cycle. Turbidity remains compliant. However, despite a brief non-compliance with coliform levels in the source water, Drinking water leaving the treatment plant continues to meet all criteria for treated water to provide safe drinking water to customers. The original surface water treatment rule established criteria to avoid filtration and to treat giardia with chlorine alone. The enhanced surface water treatment rules increase treatment requirements to include a multiple treatment barrier approach. So KPU added UV disinfection. And while the enhanced rules do not change filtration avoidance criteria, they added a limited alternative to filtration, or LAF. One component of the LAF is watershed protection and control. And the second is the level of water quality treatment. KPU watersheds are owned by the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. A 1939 Congressional Act protects and restricts access into this watershed's boundaries. With this, the watershed is solely set aside as a municipal water supply reserve for use and benefit of the people of Ketchikan. With the exception of authorized personnel, access to the Ketchikan watershed is restricted. The LAF requires KPU to provide more treatment than filtration and chlorine disinfection alone. However, KPU's current treatment process already exceeds these treatment levels and assures the delivery of safe, potable water to its customers. Therefore, KPU is now seeking to obtain the LAF under Section 106 of the Safe Drinking Water Act. This will require approval by the EPA and approval of new drinking water regulations by the state of Alaska. The city of Ketchikan now seeks approval 
from the State of Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, ADEC, for a limited alternative to filtration under the Safe Drinking Water Act. If approved, there would be no reduction in the quality or safety of the water KPU will deliver to its customers. KPU aims to do what is right for the people of Ketchikan by providing safe, reliable, and an affordable water supply to its customers in compliance with all ADEC and US EPA regulations. Taking advantage of the LAF removes undue environmental and financial impacts imposed by constructing a costly new water filtration plant while allowing KPU to continue its mission of delivering safe and affordable drinking water to all of its customers. The Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, ADEC, is the primary agency in Alaska for all federal and state drinking water regulations. ADEC fully supports Ketchikan's request for limited alternative to filtration and is proactively working with Ketchikan toward its approval. LAF approval will recognize Ketchikan's existing treatment system is fully protecting public health and no additional water treatment is needed. A big thank you to our Mayor Kiefer for doing the voiceover on the video. Also to local Catherine, Catherine Tatsuda for the cameo and to our uh, local company, Northern Creative Design, for creating the video. Uh, next, we'll go through an overview of our watershed and the water system. <clears throat> we have about 32 miles of pipe in our system and about 3,200 customers. We have 12.6 full-time water division employees. Uh, you may be wondering, how do you have six-tenths of an employee? Well, uh, we share one employee with KPU Electric on a 60 to 40 basis. Situated in the mountains behind Ketchikan, our watershed is pristine and protected. Here's a picture taken from the Ketchikan Lakes Dam, looking upstream at the lower Ketchikan Lake. There are three uses for this water in-stream flow for fish down in Ketchikan Creek, hydroelectric power, and then also drinking water for the city. Here's a graphic showing the watershed boundary. It's in a blue line. It encompasses the lower and upper Ketchikan lakes and also Granite Basin and Fawn Lake. It's about 7,000 acres and it's primarily owned by the U.S. Forest Service with smaller area owned by the U.S. Bureau of Land Management and a small spot by Ketchikan Public Utilities. Uh, although we don't own the watershed, there was a 1939 Act of Congress that reserved and set aside this area as a municipal water supply for use and benefit of the people of the city of Ketchikan. Here's a photo of the two penstocks that route water from Ketchikan Lakes down to Fawn Lake. And next we'll talk about our drinking water treatment process. So once raw water reaches the city via a tunnel system from Fawn Lake, pipes route water to our primary chlorination facility. Here are chlorine in the form of sodium hypochlorite very similar to what's commonly known as liquid bleach, it's added in a very small dose. Uh, it then flows via pipeline to our UV disinfection facility. There, water passes through UV light, furthering the disinfection process. Next, we add soda ash for pH adjustment. After that, we add a second dose of chlorine and a very small dose of ammonia to form chloramines. It's then stored in our three gallon, or three million gallon Bear Valley Reservoir. Finally, we add a small dose of phosphoric acid for corrosion prevention. Here's a photo of our UV and second chlorination facilities in the foreground 
And then in the background, our Bear Valley Reservoir. Here's another view of our Bear Valley Reservoir. From there, the treated water is distributed out to our customers and also used for fire protection by a building sprinkler systems and about 400 fire hydrants throughout the community. Now I'm going to turn our presentation over to Floyd Dameron, uh, again, a VP and senior project manager for Jacobs. Thank you, Floyd. Well, good evening, and thank, thank you all for attending. We appreciate your interest in the project. As um, I stated, I'm the project manager with Jacobs. I've been supporting Ketchikan for approximately 25 years as the regulations, uh, because of things that are going on mainly in the lower 48, the regulations change, and KPU very proactively keeps up with those changes. And um, let's forward here. There's uh, multiple projects that Ketchikan has proactively instituted over the years, starting in 19... 56 when disinfection first started by adding chlorine to the water. And then as uh, drinking water regulations came into effect, Bear Valley Reservoir was added because that cold water needed two or three hours of contact time with the chlorine to properly uh, disinfect the water. And then uh, as um, Seth mentioned, soda ash is added to the water for corrosion control. UV disinfection was put into place because in 1993 there was a outbreak in Milwaukee where 400,000 residents became ill and a couple of dozen people died because of a bacteria called cryptosporidium that at that point had not been regulated. EPA decided, especially for communities that don't filter their water, they need to add UV disinfection so that if crypto was in the water, it would be eliminated and chloramination and secondary um, chlorine was uh, instituted. So let's talk about historical water quality uh, issues that KPU has um, addressed over the years. So some of the primary uh, items that EPA, DEC, and KPU are very interested in is how much turbidity is in the water how corrosive is the water, which may leach metals into the water system and show up at the customer's tap? How much naturally occurring bacteria and viruses in the water, and how is that treated? And then, if you treat the water with a chemical disinfectant like chlorine, it forms what are called disinfection byproducts, and EPA has set limits on those. And then there's a uh, issue of fecal coliform. So we're going to discuss e each of those briefly. So turbidity in the surface, surface water or in the source water. And turbidity is a measure of clarity of the water, how many particles are in the water, and EPA regulates that. And uh, Ketchikan is very, uh, very proactive in monitoring turbidity. They measure turbidity continuously in the source water. And uh, occasionally, it doesn't happen often, but occasionally there have been small landslides in Granite Basin. And this is a photograph of KPU responding to a small landslide. And what KPU can do is proactively exclude that water that's coming, say, for example, from Granite Basin when there is a turbidity event. They can call up the power plant and say, hey, why don't you take on some more water and let's get that turbid water through the system and let that water uh, clear up. And the regulations allow KPU to have up to two turbidity events in any one year, but no more than five events in any 10 years. And I'm happy to report that we've only had two events in the last 15 years. And so it's something that we look at every day and make sure that we're in compliance. So the next item is uh, how corrosive is the water? And typically, many Alaskan waters have uh, a certain amount of corrosivity. And uh, they're even slightly on the acidic side of the pH scale. And what typically happens is the water that comes to the customers is low in copper and lead, but the plumbing in the house and the uh, brass fixtures 
when they come in contact with water that's slightly acidic, copper and lead is leached into the system. And so EPA has very stringently uh, regulated those. And you can't have more than 1.3 parts per million of copper in the water. And then a very minute amount of lead is allowed, 15 parts per billion, which is getting pretty close to zero. And fortunately, there's a low-cost way to address that. Ketchikan adds soda ash to the water. And a very small dose of soda ash is all that's required to take the water from the slightly acidic side of the pH scale to the slightly basic side of the scale. And KPU takes samples on a very frequent basis to demonstrate that uh, they're completely in compliance with the uh, lead and copper rule requirements. And this is an example uh, of a pitcher in KPU's facility. There are bags of soda ash, and it goes into equipment where it's dissolved in a solution and then injected into the water. Uh, you can't taste it. Uh, thousands and thousands of utilities across the country use soda ash for a pH balance in the water. So the next uh, really big, the big deal, the really important item are the naturally occurring bacteria and viruses that occur in the water. And uh, KPU is required to either kill or there's another term called inactivation, which means that the bacteria cannot reproduce. And so by using chlorine and ultraviolet light, the source water is completely disinfected so that when the water is delivered to the customers, it's safe. And KPU actually every day creates their own weak solu solution of bleach. It's manufactured right here in Ketchikan at their facilities. And you just take salt and you dissolve it in water and create a brine solution. You pass that through an electrical current and you create a weak fresh bleach solution, and that is what is injected into your water. Then there's a fairly new uh, regulated constituent called disinfection byproducts. And what EPA has discovered is that all utilities across the, the United States have to treat for this. And if disinfection byproducts are high, if someone drinks that water over a period of several decades, there is some possibility that they will develop uh, cancer. So EPA has decided to regulate that. And um, we have dissolved organics in the water, naturally from the watershed. And when those dissolved organics combine with chlorine, they do form uh, disinfection byproducts. And so um, this slide shows if you look at this green line, shows that in 2003, 2004, the water was very close to the limit of 60 parts per billion of halicetic acids, which is one of the disinfection byproduct constituents. But either because of climate change or changes in the watershed, you can see from about 2006 to 2013, there was a considerable increase in the disinfection byproducts in the water that was being delivered to KPU customers. And so KPU very proactively said, okay, we gotta come into compliance. How are we gonna do this? And a two-step process was instituted and one was to add a very small dose of ammonia to the water which changes free chlorine to chloramines. And there's about 100 million Americans across the United States that's drinking water that has a small dose of ammonia. It's not something unique to catch a can. And then we split the chlorine dose up into two locations to control how chlorine reacts. And so you can see a very dramatic improvement. We had a 65% reduction in halocetic acids because of these two steps that were taken care of and we're completely, uh, KPU is completely in uh, compliance. So um, someone asked me recently, if we build a filter plant, can we stop chloraminating our water? And I think that, you know, that's an excellent question. There's still someone's really thinking, thinking through what's going on here. 
But the processes of dissolved organics, they typically will pass right through a traditional filter plant. And so from the data we have, it's likely that if a very expensive filter plant was ordered, excuse me, was constructed is what I meant to say, most likely chloramination will have to continue because of this dramatic amount of halocetic acid that's formed from those dissolved organics. So I hope that answers that question. So the more, a more recent issue are fecal coliforms in the source water. Now this is the raw, untreated water. It has nothing to do with coliforms in the water delivered to the customers. So Ketchikan used to measure total coliforms, and we found that it would be more accurate and better for Ketchikan if fecal coliforms were measured. And this, this comes from warm-blooded warm animals in the watershed. And we believe because of a drought condition that occurred in late 2018 and 2019, fecal coliforms were allowed to accumulate in the watershed, and then when normal rainfalls returned, it washed those coliforms into Ketchikan Lake and into the stream Granite Basin is, and delivered those to the water system. And for a very short period of time, as illustrated by this slide, the standard is 90% of all your samples have to have 20 or less fecal coliforms per 100 milliliters. And you can see that in 2019, for a very brief period of time, there was slightly more than 20. And within about three or four weeks of that happening, the state of Alaska ordered Ketchikan to build a filter plant. Um, they said they didn't have a choice. So together, partnered up with Ketchikan, we looked at this very vigorously and said, wow. And, and also, they said you have to build it within 18. You have to filter your water within 18 months, which is impossible. It would take probably five years to uh, design and construct a filter plant. So we said, let's look at an alternative, and the alternative is called limited alternative filtration. And when a regulation was passed recently, they allowed for systems that don't filter their water like Ketchikan, and there's a lot of systems that don't filter their water. If your watershed is uninhabited and undeveloped, and they use the term called consolidated ownership that we can talk a little bit, but the main thing is, can KPU control access to the watershed by the public, and can KPU stop development in the watershed? And importantly, is the treatment system in place today that Ketchikan uses to deliver safe, affordable water to their customers, if that's better than building a filter plant and chlorine alone, then the law allows the state of Alaska and EPA to grant limited alternative filtration. So in 1989, the surface water treatment rule was a major regulation that impacted KPU, and because of the event that happened in Milwaukee in 1993 that I mentioned, and there were a few other cryptosporidium outbreaks in the lower 48, one in Oregon, one in Georgia, EPA decided, hey, we need an enhanced rule which required the installation of UV light disinfection, but they also said we're going to allow a limited alternative to filtration if certain criteria are met. So let's look at how KPU is done with filtration avoidance. This was in the video. And here are all the, all the criteria that are required. I'm not going to read them to you, but the check marks say KPU is in total compliance. Um, then we had this small exceedance of fecal coliforms that occurred in 2019. So has anyone else ever had an issue like this? Yes, city of Seattle, and what is called the Cedar Water Source. And this serves 
many hundreds of thousands of people in Seattle, they applied for a limited alternative filtration with the state of Washington, and that was approved. State of Washington determined unfiltered water treatment plant provided greater treatment than filtration and chlorine alone. And the Cedar facility has been in compliance for 15 years. And just, just as a matter of coincidence, my company, Jacobs Engineering Group, has run this plant for the last 15 years. And it's never had a violation of the treatment rule requirements. And we're saying if it's good enough for Seattle, it should be good enough for Ketchikan. So Ketchikan formally entered into a legally binding document called a compliance order by consent. And that was um, formalized approximately six months ago. And in that formal document, KP was required to do the following. Develop, oops, sorry, develop a, a watershed control program, which KPU already has a program. They just needed, they needed to update it. Document who owns the watershed and document that KPU actually does have control of access to the watershed. Produce a report that documents all the hundreds and thousands of water tests that KPU does. Put those in a formal document and demonstrate that KPU does, in fact, properly treat its water. Document formally the treatment processes that are in place. And then they said, and you also need to have a public process. And we developed the video. I think everyone that's a customer received a postcard recently in the mail. There was a newspaper article, a newspaper ad, and the culmination of all this public process is the meeting that we're having tonight. So this slide documents that each of those items need to be complete by 531 next year. And, and we're totally committed and partnered up with Ketchikan that we will meet all of those criteria well before that date. In fact, the last criteria here, the public involvement, Tonight's meeting is, is the conclusion of that. But we're working very vigorously right now on updating the watershed control program. Ketchikan has hired a, a law firm to help them formally document and present to the state and EPA this whole topic of consolidated ownership and demonstrate that there is, as Seth said earlier, is a 1939 act of Congress thank goodness, that says the watershed is set aside and dedicated solely for drinking water for the citizens of Ketchikan. And just this year, KPU received letters from the U.S. Forest Service and BLM saying, we acknowledge that law. We have no plans for any development. We know it's for a water source. And so we think that we can very easily document for DEC and EPA, this consolidated ownership. And so uh, we're moving forward uh, very vigorously right now and in the middle of all of these activities. So what is the next steps in schedule? So we noticed the uh, nonconformance event may we put in the, the compliance order by consent. We're having this meeting tonight. All the COBC tasks are due by May of next year, and we'll get them done way before that. And then ADEC, State of Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, has, has a very important step where they need to move forward and take the federally allowed requirement for limited alternative filtration and promulgate that into Alaska law, into our, into our drinking water regulations. They've already drafted up the language to do that. They will need to hold a uh, public meeting to get comments from people and see how the public feels about changing the water regulations to allow limited al alternative filtration. And with EPA's OK, DEC can issue the limited alternative filtration to catch a can. And it's possible that could happen by the end of 2022. More likely, it will happen sometime in 2023. 
So why is limited alternative to filtration important to all KPU customers? So here is an artist's rendition of what a water filter plant would actually look like up near Fawn Lake with all the multiple buildings. There's chemicals involved, there's pumps involved, there's filters, there's backwash water, there's collection of waste. And so our estimate is $70 million for design and construction of such a facility. And just think about $70 million being spread across not all that many customers. Two to three million dollars to operate it for the chemicals, for the electricity, for the uh, operation staff, and to replace components as they wear out. Over 10 acres will have to be cleared, and just think about the thousands of gallons of diesel that will be burned by all the construction equipment, and the thousands of yards of concrete, and the million pounds of reinforcing steel that would go into such a facility. It will have high energy use. It will use a lot of chemicals. There will be waste products to dispose of. And honestly, you're, you, all the water that you're getting today meets all of the state and federal drinking water regulations. So how do you get better than that? And so it's, frankly, it's a technicality in the regulations that is driving this whole topic. Fortunately, we have a means to offset that with the provision called limited alternative filtration. So what, what happens if Ketchikan had to, had to build such a facility? So how do you like the idea of, our estimate is your water rate would go up 100%. We know Ketchikan is under financial stress right now. If there's no health benefit to doing that, what is, the, what is the value of shocking the community with such a significant construction project and a project that has to operate and using all the chemicals and et cetera? So I guess I'll just let that sink in for a minute for you. KPU is not wanting to do anything whatsoever to compromise public health. Let me assure you that. Public health is being met today. All the regulations are being met for drinking water. And so... We just wanted to inform you of the process that KPU is going through. And so Seth will come up and uh, entertain any questions that you might have. And, and thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Floyd. So now's the time uh, this evening to take any comments or questions um, from the audience. A lot of information presented there. Uh, do we have anyone with questions or comments? Thank you. Robert Sievertson, 3817 Alaska Avenue. Um, I was a mayor when this thing first started and um, I'd like to thank everybody that has worked on this project to bring common sense to our drinking water. Um, as was stated earlier, you can spend all the money on this treatment plant, but it's not going to provide you with any better water than what you have today. I think that we're caught up in a, uh, uh, you know, a small regulation that, um, that's given us the problem in regards to property ownership and, and then some of the few other odds and ends about that. But I'd like to thank ADEC for all the work that they've done on this. And as I understand it, ADEC has primacy in the state of Alaska in regards to writing water regulations. Yes. And um, I'm in hopes that by presenting the case uh, later on that we'll be able to avoid uh, such an expense to the the general public because it's uh, it's unnecessary and it would create a hardship on our community and I just want to go on the record that I think limited alternative to filtration is the correct path for the city of Ketchikan and the science uh, about our water quality our water treatment is tried and proven and I appreciate all the work that KPU does for that thank you
Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the audience? Uh, if you do have further questions or comments, uh, or if you're participating via the live stream, you can email those uh, comments or questions in to the two email addresses listed here or to the phone number to our local KPU office here. Uh, if something comes up uh, afterwards, please do reach out to us. We'll do our best to answer any questions you have. So with that, with no other questions from the audience, I'd like to thank you all again uh, for being here tonight. We sure appreciate it, and we'll bring a close to this meeting. Thank you. Uh, if you could, please sign in. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet uh, out at the entryway. I appreciate it, and thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>